Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's been a while, I know, but I wanted to kind of kick things off again by going, uh, having a little post-mortem on the um, Tamiya 32nd F4E Phantom that I've just completed. Uh, this model took about two years. Now, most of that calendar time wasn't actually working on the model. It was uh, not working on the model because my man cave hobby room kind of became a hold all for all the overflow uh, we were accumulating in the house. Um, during that time, I, I would squeeze in here and work on it here and there, um, but just the state of the room was depressing and not motivating and coming in here was kind of hard. and. Uh, with a lot of other stuff going on in life that I was dealing with, there wasn't a lot of model time consistently until about the past month or so when I decided to get up here and clean things out and reorganize and throw things away and get going on this one again um, with the goal of finishing it by the 30th for a show we have here in Houston. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to make it. Um, this kit was one that... I kind of shied away from for some time um, because there's some issues with it. Uh, the big one being the uh, exhaust uh, in the in the kit from Tamiya are undersized. Now there's speculation on the internet that the guy that was drawing them up in CAD or whatever was normally tasked with working on armor and put them in 135th scale instead of 132nd scale. I haven't checked the math on that to know if they line up with actually being in 135th scale, but they're comically undersized. Uh, I'll overlay a picture from the internet so you can see. Um, but Simon, a friend of mine, Simon, uh, told me that there was a solution to that, and that is um, actually through aftermarket uh, for exhaust cans meant for the Ravel kit, actually. Now, they're made by a company called QMT, and the only place I could source them from was... Uh, in the UK at Hannett's, uh, but they drop right in. Um, they're not even glued, they're just pressure fitted in. They fit perfectly, uh, and they're much closer to the correct size um, for for the kit. Now, uh, once again, these are the Ravel uh, option from QMT. They're for the Ravel kit. Now, QMT also makes a set for the Tamiya kit, I believe. I'm not sure, but I think it if it, if they do i think it suffers from the same problem as like the edward and the aries for this kit is that they match the kit size now res kit has recently released uh, an exhaust option for this kit uh, that apparently does fit uh, my friend simon has a set of those and has tested them um, i will probably be using those in the when i build the j uh, just for something a little bit different <clears throat> Uh, they work well, though. I just ordered another set for the Ravel G that I'm going to build, and I look forward to using them on that. That's the that's the biggest issue with the kit. Um, before the QMT and the now Res kit, that was kind of something um, you weren't going to solve. You'll see tons of builds online with uh, even with aftermarket exhaust from Aries or Edward or the like. Uh, they're they're undersized. There's a big gap back there. Um, Again, I'll show an overlay, uh, and, and it, it just it takes away from the whole model. It, it really kills the model for me. I, I, I don't like it. Um, that's a big reason I've been avoiding it. There's other issues. There's small things that can be corrected. All of them uh, I did deal with. We'll get to them in turn. Uh, the kit started with sanding off all the raised panels. Um, some people say it's battle damage. Some people say it's just because to me it's stupid. I don't know. I don't know what happened with them um, on their 30-second kits, but there's a lot of there's a lot of panels to be sanded off. Uh, again, I'm going to overlay a lot of pictures from um, work in progress to kind of hit home uh, the points I'm going to be making here and there. But there, there's panels to be sanded off. It, it's not anything complicated. It's just time-consuming. You sand them off, rescribe, re-rivet. Uh, it's pretty easy with the right tools. And that was the first step with getting. Um, the model on its way to being completed once you know the exhaust problem was taken care of and i didn't have to worry about uh, running into that problem now the other big problem with the kit obviously is the intakes um the it, it's pretty pretty hard to get them seamless uh, it can be done with sheet styrene it was just more work than i wanted to do considering i just buy fod covers uh, there's a few uh, there's a couple of seamless options but they've become hard to find i couldn't find one i uh, did look 
but I could not find any of the seamless intakes. I think DN molds or I don't know, somebody makes one, but I could not find any. Now, um, so buying five covers, that problem was out of the way. Uh, the next big issue uh, with the kit is one that I wasn't aware of when I uh, initially was avoiding it is uh, the cockpit. The cockpit is um, okay. It's not greatly detailed for a 30 second kit, especially by today's standards, especially by Tamiya standards with their 30 second props that come after this. Uh, the, the cockpit detail is okay, but it's lacking and. The only resin set I think available for the E is by Legends, I want to say, and it's not that great. Uh, and it's also hard to find. Um, if you use the cockpit, um, the cockpit tub from the kit, there's a problem at the back bulkhead that um, they, the two parts from the fuselage part and the bulkhead don't line up. Uh, that was cut off, and I rebuilt the rear bulkhead with styrene. And uh, that solved that issue. Now, what I did with the cockpit was I had a J Avionics cockpit from a J kit that I had that I'm not going to be able to build the build the J kit because it's missing some parts. Um, and I thought about just using the whole entire cockpit and just saying, screw it, let the back seat be wildly inaccurate. I don't care, you know, just as long as I have some detail back there. But ultimately, I cut the front cockpit off. I used the front cockpit of the avionics set for the model, um, mostly because um, mostly because it's pretty much the same from my understanding. So I used the avionics in the front, um, just cutting the, the rear cockpit off of it. Uh, it fit no problem. I used the sidewalls uh, from the avionics on the front and the back. Uh, and then I scratch built some details on the back bulkhead uh, to kind of keep it in line with what's going on in the front. Not, not my best effort. I'm not really that great at scratch building, but I was confident in what I was able to do to, you know, busy the cockpit up. And as you can see from, from this angle, it's, it's kind of difficult to, um, to see in there that great anyway. Um, now the cockpit being out of the way uh, with that rear sidewall taken care of. Um, it was pretty straightforward from there. There was just some minor things through the build. Uh, one of them being, one that's pretty well known actually on this kit is the vertical stabilizer. There is a gap along the bottom here. Quite a large gap actually. And some people seem to think that if you file down, hack down, the stub in the kit, um, that the that it's just too high, that it's hitting the the stop piece inside the vertical stabilizer that's supposed to hold it in place. It's it's too high, so it's hitting that and preventing it from falling down. That's just not the case. I practically cut the thing off. It did nothing to help. If you look real closely at the photos, you can see that the profile of the bottom of the vertical stabilizer part is different than the profile of the fuselage. They're not curved the same. Now you could probably, maybe, with a sander, get in there and fix that, but this is just too much risk. You, you're doing it freehand. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just glue it on and fill it. It's exactly what I did. Glue, glued it on and filled it. The other issue that I would like to talk about is something that you definitely should worry about. Um, something you should definitely be worried about if you, uh, if you build this kit is the wing roots. The wing root join is pretty terrible on the Tamiya, uh, kit. It's just not beefy enough. If you come in and if you build it as it is out of the kit and you come in and you push down on it, I'm not going to push down on it, but if you push down on it, it's going to break away because all that's there is that thin lip of the top piece of the wing. The thin, the, the, the thin lip uh, glues up there, and if you, if you just rely on that little bit, you're going to break it. I did it in, in one of the past attempts at this model, um, and I've had plenty of people warn me about that in the build process along the way. Um, it's another easy fix. You can just put some styrene in there to reinforce it. 
Uh, one other small problem I had with the ring, wing roots uh, was a result of the fuselage, and I think it was just the um, the fuselage being warped a little bit. They uh, the wing roots didn't match up uh, with the fuselage sides, uh, but that was easily fixed by putting some shims inside the fuselage. Uh, that easily solved that problem. Uh, nothing big at all. And the last major thing with the kit, the kind of off-putting thing, uh, if you will, is the um, the outer wing dihedral, and as it comes out of the kit, is way too uh, way too high. It, it, it's way too. Uh, I'm blanking here. It's canted too far up. I'm not sure when it is out of the kit. I think I've seen that it's something like around 20, 20 between 20 and 22 degrees, but um, that can be fixed. Uh, it's supposed to be 12 and a half degrees, and that can be fixed with a you just do it manually, or you can do it with a jig. There's a jig by, I think it's Nautilus Models or something. Uh, it's a balsa jig, laser cut. And then you just put it together and stick the model on top of it. And you can situate the outer wings at the correct dihedral. It's very easy to use. Uh, the only real problem with that is it leaves some gaps at the join on the top and the bottom. Um, and you have to come back in and deal with those, but those are easily dealt with. Uh, as far as construction goes... That's really all I can remember um, kind of being challenging there was the dihedral, the cockpit, the vertical stabilizer, uh, the intakes. There is some niggly stuff with uh, the nose join. Uh, there was a little bit of step where the, the E-nose grafts onto the fuselage uh, easily dealt with. Uh, let's move into the finishing. Um, This kit taught me some things in the finishing process. First of all, I uh, attempted black basing, and I've decided that uh, I will not be doing that anymore. I think it's pretty silly on all but a few colors. It works well on grays, um, but other colors, it's just a pain in the ass. The On the bottom, uh, with the bottom camouflage color, it shifts the color uh, too cold to, when you have black under it. It's even worse with white. White over black uh, comes out um, not near as warm as it should be in many cases. Um, the big problem with the black on, on painting this model was, honestly, with the, um, was honestly, uh, the biggest problem with the black basing were, were the greens. Um, it, it's hard to get uh, differentiation between the two green colors. Um, with black as an under base. The only way you're really going to do it is build it up with a lighter color and that creates its own problems is really you want darker colors uh, under the shading you want to build up from darker colors. It, that just doesn't work. With these greens they're vir they're virtually um, unrecognizable. Uh, you can't you can't see much difference until you've built it up so much that it makes no sense to black base in the first place. Uh, I did some repairs late in the build where I had to go back and shoot a few spots here and there, uh, like the nose. I had to uh, fix a uh, a pretty gnarly uh, ghost scene that showed up way late in the build. And when I went back over that, I went with gray primer and built the green up over the gray primer. And it, it was kind of the same thing because the green before had been built up over the black. It was much darker than it was building up over the gray. I had to use way more paint than I than I should have. And that was just a problem the whole time is fighting the black, especially with the dark green. Uh, the dark green is very hard to see on the black until you've built it up. I had to build up uh, just enough, so much that it made black, the black undercoat was just pointless. Uh, it makes no sense. Um, I can, I, I, I'm not giving up on, on layering uh, in itself. I think, I think layering is, is a valid technique. I just think uh, with you, you, you need different colors. The one thing I would change about the paint on this is uh, I'd probably lighten the brown more from the get-go uh, with the initial base coat of brown. Uh, it when when the weathering starts, it kind of goes darker than a lot of photo shows. I mean, photos are reference photos are um, scattered. Some the brown is faded almost to to a dirty white. Um, now I'm sure there's some color fidelity problems with with photos from that era, but they um, the the brown can get quite light 
in, in some cases, and I'd probably have started with a lighter color. Now, I will talk about the paint um, that I used on here. Uh, generally, I like using MRP uh, or, or um, similar lacquers. Uh, MRP or Mr. Color is what I use mostly. And the MRP, I, I'm starting to notice that a lot of their color fidelity is just not good. So, uh, a lot of their colors are just off. Like their MiG-29 color, the MiG-29 is the last um, model I finished before this one. And uh, their green color uh, for the Russian scheme comes from DCS, the flight simulator, and is just wildly inaccurate. I had to... Um, I had to futz with that one a good bit to get it how I wanted. Uh, the brown, MRP's brown, is lighter than Mr. Color's. I use Mr. Color here. Uh, MRP's brown is lighter, but it's just not the right saturation. It just does not look right you know, compared to any photos I've seen. It doesn't look anything close to correct. It doesn't even look like the highly faded versions. It's just there's something too... There's something off about it. It just doesn't look right. Now, I did use it uh, in kind of a layering uh, with a sponge layering type thing where you use sponge on some uh, liquid mask and then spray over it. And uh, kind of it's basically salt chipping, but with a sponge instead of salt. And it's not really chipping. It's just putting some variation into the paint. I didn't do as much on this as I, as I probably should have, actually. But uh, I used the Mr. Color Brown um, as the... This is the main color. Now there's some other browns worked into there. Um, for the greens, I did use the Mr. Co uh, Mr. Paint colors, both of them. Um, and they're pretty close to the Mr. Color from what I've seen. I don't have the Mr. Colors on hand, but I, I think that the greens are much more accurate. Uh, the problem with those for me, again, was just um, doing them over the black. Um, and I also use Mr. Color on the belly. Uh, not because of any real problem with um, with uh, Mr. Paint colors, but more so just Mr. Color was one I could find. When I, I, I had to order um, the color for the bottom, I didn't have it on hand when I started this, and at that time was the height of COVID and the supply issues and the shipping issues, and uh, nobody was sending anything cross borders, so all Sprue Brothers had a, of that color at the time was Mr. Color, and it kind of reintroduced me to using Mr. Color. I ordered that in the brown at the same time. It had been a while because I've been relying solely on MRP, and I'm starting to think I'm probably not going to be investing much in MRP moving forward if I can get Mr. Color. Mr. Color uh, is much thicker out of the bottle, so if you thin it down to the same consistency as MRP is out of the bottle, you probably get two and a half times more in a bottle of MRP for half the price. Uh, and not that cost is a concern to me, but it's just that I'm falling less and less in love with MRP. Uh, it's also not seeming to age well in the bottle. Uh, most of the bottles I have are three, four, five years old, uh, and some of those are starting they're needing to be thin they can be thin and worked with but they're not as great out of the bottle as they were uh, when new weathering i moved on to weathering and that was another challenge for me is um, the brown's pretty simple with the oils it's all oils um, the browns are, is is kind of easy to gunk up with the uh, different browns uh, tans um, the dark green was the one that's really the problem, uh, to come over with. Um, I hit it with some light buff color, which, um, desaturated and faded it a little bit, which, uh, ended up looking great. Uh, I went over it with a lighter color, just stippling it, um, with, with a sponge or, or stippling brush. And, uh, the same with the light green except I used um, I used buffs but I also used yellows and then I came in with some darker green I don't have any oils uh, that are on the right coolness level for the for the dark green they're a little too a little too cool you put them over and it starts to look comical uh, so eh, weathering the the green, uh, the dark green was a, a little bit of a chore uh, in comparison to the other things. 
the um, leading edges were chipped with hairspray. Uh, the other chipping, let me move the model around. The other chipping, like up here and, uh, and along the uh, edge here and then on the outside of the cockpit there. That was all done with um, uh, ammo, um, MIG ammo oil brusher. The, the silver oil brusher now, they sent me this um, when I made a big order from them as a gift. Uh, apparently they were sending out uh, oil brushers as gifts and orders at that time. Uh, they might still be. Uh, trying to get people to buy them, and I was I was kind of curious why would uh why would I want silver oil paint? Um, I actually had ooh about eighteen other oil brush colors that somebody had sent me to try because they didn't like them, and I ended up selling those um, or giving those away because uh, you know I just in comparison with the with the other oils I normally use the five hundred twos. Uh, I just didn't see much use for them, but I did keep the silver because I thought, well, that's a unique color. And if you get a tiny, tiny brush, uh, 3.0 or even smaller, maybe, I don't remember what size brush I use, but you can come back and you can brush these on. Uh, the trick with that is, is because they're oils, you just, you got to do it and you got to set it aside because if you touch them, they're going to smear. And But if you use it um, sparingly and with taste in the proper places, I think the oil brusher actually works pretty good for chipping. I wouldn't do it for overall chipping for large quantities like on the on wing roots of a World War II airplane or like the leading edges here even. Um, move on to the lower end. The weapons. Um, out of the box. Everything's out of the box here. Uh, the Mark 82s and the wing tanks. Uh, I wanted something simple. Uh, I didn't want to spend a bunch of money on uh, aftermarket weapons here. Especially considering eh, the Mark 82s are, are okay shaped. And there's not many uh, references of these carrying much else um, besides Mark 82s. You know, they carry them in different configurations. But uh, that's pretty much it. Now... One thing that to me a kit tells you is to put the sidewinder rails on the triple uh, on the pylon with the triple ejector rack. That's uh, an Air Force that didn't happen in the Air Force. The Navy did it. The Air Force did not do it. So you kind of have to uh, fill those holes on the pylons, and you see see it a lot. See people do it a lot, but um, it's not accurate apparently. And not that I generally care about that too much, but it is something to be aware of. Um, the only the aftermarket I used on this kit uh, were the wheels. Uh, to me, it gives you those uh, nasty vinyl wheels. So um, these are oh, they're QMT also. QMT makes a wide uh, a variety of uh, aftermarket parts for the thirty second Phantoms, both the Rebellions and the, uh, the the wheels are QMT. They they work great, um, and the ejection seats are quick boost. Um, in lieu of Aries, I like the quick boost because uh, they have the molded on belts, and I prefer the molded on belts uh, in 30 second with jets. It's just they're easy to paint. They usually look good if the if the molding's good. Um, the FOD covers are of course aftermarket, and then the the um, angle of attack uh, and pitot tubes are uh, master metal, um, and that's it for aftermarket. Uh, oh, and the exhaust. Okay, I'm going to talk about weathering the exhaust area now. Uh, it's kind of hard to get on the on the camera here. I'm, I'm futzing with it, and I'm not getting great lighting because of the shapes there. Uh, but if you notice, if you look at references closely, you'll see a, um, a striping, striation thing that happens in this, on, on this part of the, the heat shield here, especially. Um... I think it's because of a distribution of heat and because there's uh, support bracing uh, on the underside there that absorbs the heat differently that it causes that. I wanted to replicate that here. Um, it, you don't always see it on the heat shields. Uh, it's not always present, but it's something that, uh, that when it is, it's very visually interesting. So I, I wanted to recreate that, and I did so with some various layers of paint. 
uh, and thin strips of tape and then it's been weathered with uh, oils and a dab or two of uh, pigments there for the exhaust staining um, but that's how we weathered that and then oils all over uh, the the rest of the heat shield as well I varied up I varied up the um, panels with different shades of all the metallics or MRP with different shades of MRP um, in the meantime, I'm going to leave you with some still shots in a slideshow, uh, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining.